I'm going to talk to you today. Actually, first, I'd like, just like to start with a little word of prayer, okay? Father, thank you so much for another day of life and all the gifts and blessings that we're enjoying that you are giving to us. And we just ask that you will bless this presentation and that it will speak to those here and that you will um, give me the words and wisdom and knowing how to um, present this in a way that will be helpful. Thank you. All right. So the reason I kind of started with saying that we farm for 40 years is there's many ways to diversify a farm. Some of that is just processes over time that kind of lead to something else. Um, but there's other areas that, um, that I'll be bringing through in this presentation in ways of diversifying. Uh, uh, just as an introduction here, Judy's the heavy lifter here. I, I kind of was just brought in to kind of help. She said, would you help me kind of talk about some of the stuff? So I'm kind of a secondary here, but I'm going to chip in on this. Yeah, in, in the farming practices, um, of course, I've been on this journey along with Brad, but I, I've been more management, business, you know, inventory, predicting what, much, how much we're going to pack in a box in a day, all that kind of stuff, versus the actual growing. And then I'm just going to just let you know that, um, yeah, he's just, he has a lot more in his in his head on all this because he's the one who's actually kind of, I mean, I've had my hands in the dirt with him too, a lot too, but he's the mind behind it all. <laughs> so. Okay, so here's a long time ago in the beginning, um, there's Brad when he's first starting his little farming venture. Um, right here, you can see, um, what do you call that you're using? That was actually a... Uh High pressure uh, in water injector. We we uh, high pressure with CO two, and I was just transplanting vegetables in the field with a little water drill. It didn't work out very well, but that was at the early stages trying to kind of. Uh, and you can see it's it's very simply done. There's no plastic for weed control or you know much of anything. It's just kind of work ground, and here they go, and 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 they're sticking the plants in in the. In the field. Okay. Um, so um, I'm, I'm kind of coming from the premise that I think if you're here, you're supposedly already growing something, but it, it doesn't really matter. Um, but, you know, decisions to kind of think about if you really are thinking about farming or even if you are farming now and you're wanting to diversify. <laughs> Where do you want to start? Are, are you wanting to start with a, a product you want to grow? Or are you wanting to think, you know, am I going to have a market for this product? Maybe, maybe it's just another question. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm open to questions because, you know, I, I don't have or that many slides. So. Where there are no problems to solve. Is, 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 are most of you here garden? level or or interested in in diversifying any kind of farming or you're interested in in, in oh okay well good we're glad you're here <laughs> okay well there are things to consider you know and and are you are you gonna have a market for what you're growing is there a need a demand for you know for what you're wanting to do because um, you want to be able to sell your product or it's not going to be a good thing to grow it. So here's just a picture of Brad starting out. And this is kind of how he started his marketing. <laughs> he kind of loaded his stuff in his truck and he just went down the roads and stopped at markets and roadsides. And yeah, because one of the things, in, it may be in your case, I don't know if that's true or not, you want to grow stuff. And it's a neat thing. And you like the produce and you like the beauty and you want to sell it too. So that's kind of where I started. I started before the market. I started with the greens and said, hey, I'm going to grow stuff. But then, it, of course, eventually you can't keep doing that without run out of money and energy. So we would go, I'd go, uh, I'd just sometimes take my pickup 
and I'd take an umbrella and some signs. I'd go roadside. I'd just park along someplace I knew people were driving by and try to sell stuff. So that's that's one diversity, you know. And then eventually it generates into other things. But that's just this. In this case, I was taking this to San Francisco. We were overloaded. This is a three quarter ton truck. I had about five thousand pounds on it. I drove it to San Francisco. We already had this sold, so I drove it in. I'm telling you more now than I probably need to, but we found that our local markets at that stage didn't want, wouldn't pay very much for organic food. They did, so the organic food movement was in the um, the, the wholesale in, in the in the city. They were willing to pay more money for an organic product. Our local guys. They wanted a cheap melon or whatever it was. We couldn't afford to grow organically and sell. So we could sell wholesale better than we could sell retail with our farm. That's how we got started doing it wholesale. Okay. So so if you're just kind of starting and thinking this is something that you want to do, Brad was able to use a piece of ground from his dad where a young orchard was started. And he actually, it wasn't all open ground that his dad already had put young prune trees on uh, there. And so in this picture, you can see he's planting um, his produce in between the little prune trees that his dad started. So that's another way of diversifying is, is you know, thinking of creative ways of where you can plant your product. Okay, um, so so once you've had your dream and you are growing, if you're going that way, you know, and as Brad was saying, you need to be able to sell your product um, to support yourself. And, and I just put this picture up here because it kind of all coincided why, when Brad started his produce business and they were just starting a distribution business, these three ladies, years ago uh, in San Francisco. And so he, he built a relationship with them. They actually got their own first truck, and they would drive around and pick up produce from farmers, and then they would take it back, buy it from you, and sell it to the markets in San Francisco. And so um, they, I think, occasionally would spend the night on our farm. Uh, they, one of them actually helped plant tomatoes one day. Anyway, um, and as I go through some of these slides with that, here's now they have a, a lot of trucks and you know they've been very successful too but um, we still have a bond with them you know and 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 like now we've just acquired another market in San Francisco and we'd like them to do our trucking for us hey we want to help you you know we want to make you know make a good price for you so the more you can kind of get on a, on a you know not a buddy best friend level or anything like that but if, if you can have a rapport with some of your marketers it, it immensely will help in your sales. And here's another, um, we invite our buyers to the farm. You know, they don't, they don't all take us up on it, but um, sometimes they do. And actually this was a group on the higher end of Whole Foods that came and we took them on a farm tour and, and we made them lunch with all of our produce at the time. And, um, you know, it, it just made a, a I'm trying to think of the word I'm trying to think where they're going to, you're kind of going to be a priority. They're going to want to buy your product. They're going to want to support you. So when we talk about diversifying, as I'm going through my slides, um, there's going to be different ways. Um, but I'm going to start with this one. And once you've established your commodities and markets, um, you know, you might want to think of adding something, something different. Um, and reasons you might want to do that um, is it can increase profit on small farms. It reduces economic risk with weather or damage to a crop. So, you know, like for instance, we farm orchard and we farm produce. Well, say the weather conditions, something happened, it just rained during our prune blossom time and we have no prunes. Well, if we only grew prunes, then we'd be sunk that year. You know, we would have put all of our money into growing those, and we would have gotten no profit out of them. So um, that is one example there. 
provides greater stability and it helps develop new skills. So uh, here's a picture. Um, there's also different ways of diversifying in besides what you're growing, and, and that is where you're growing your, your food. There's the option of leasing land if you're wanting to start, but you don't feel like you can afford to buy the land and try to start up a business and farm from your land. Um, and then uh, custom harvesting. If, if you are needing a, a piece of equipment, and it doesn't even have to be custom harvesting. It can be custom plowing someone else's farmer's field that doesn't have a tractor or, you know, finding people in the area that, that need your piece of equipment. You know, there's times that, you know, we, we don't have huge tractors that we might need some work done on a piece of ground. And so there's, there's that's a uh, different way of um, diversifying. And then your seasonal crops, um, you know, uh, not just growing summer produce, but you can grow winter produce. Um, that's another way. Yeah, we have a big crop of clover. My neighbor has some open ground, and we put in alfalfa along with the red clover that they plant because they're 80 acre blocks, and it fit our program well. You know, we would do that, and so we we don't, but we don't have the equipment. What we need is farmers. So if somebody else comes in and cuts and bales. put this egg in the basket here to, to kind of tell you that diversification um, is a great way um, of really preventing some some hardships um, and and crop losses and then there you are so don't put all your eggs in one so, basket so where where do we financially kind of talk about some of the things we've done to, to diversify in various aspects well, I, yeah, I think we kind of have slides with the different things. I mean, we can talk about them here, and then we can just kind of show you the slides that kind of follow up a little bit. Yeah, I want. don't know. I'm just kind of wondering. When I look at this picture here, <clears throat> I don't know what you think, but I think, wow, that looks like a lot of work to me. <laughs> you know, you think that here you got, I don't know, what's that, maybe vegetable and then uh, another windbreak and then and it is so that's the one of the things about diversifying is it does take more thinking and more aspects to it versus a monocrop versus a monocrop where you're just you're just growing one one crop and so that's but so there's good and bad to it obviously you know you got your diversification and we've gone through all that as far as well prunes were bad we've had I've grown prunes all my life so We've had cycles where we we had to uh, uh, shake prunes on the ground and irrigate them under or disc them up. That's two different seasons, different years apart. Uh, we've had um, years where the industry said we're going to – they put California, we pushed out 17,000 acres of trees because the prune in our, in our market wasn't su supporting that much production. And so we were going through some bad slumps, and so we went – into vegetable production. We'd already been in vegetables, but we went back into those, and so that provided diversification. And some of these are their aspects, and like Judy mentioned, custom harvesting. When we first got into prunes, um, we, we didn't have machines. We hand-picked. I, I grew up in a – picking a – last orchard we picked was in 1967, hand-picked. And then since then, we've been machine harvesting. And then we got – we bought a machine. It cost like $80,000 to buy our first harvester besides the – first homemade ones we had. So that was a commercial. So that was a pretty good chunk of money. And so then we got into harvesting prunes for other growers to, to pay for that. And and it kind of caught a life of its own after that. We were doing that business plus our farming business. So anyway, that's just as far as that diversification side, we can talk about more of those things too. But Which actually got into a 30-year project of harvesting pistachios Right, so we did the, about 30 years of, of custom harvesting, and then we've since gotten out of that business. So, But I, I kind of put this picture up here partly, you know, his was it looks like a lot of work, and his, I, <laughs> mine was kind of so, 
here's an orchard, yeah, you're, you're here's right, some like an row romantic, crops, <laughs> and how beautiful right. it is. There's no weeds or anything. <laughs> Okay, so crop diversity can be seasonal, which I kind of touched on. You can grow winter crops and summer crops, um, like your lettuce and kale and spinach in the winter, and you can grow your summer products of tomatoes, melons, and, and yeah, summer squash. Yeah. So, so we've been through the full season of, of diversifying. We've grown, you know, beets and um, daikon radish and cabbages and, and the winter crops. In through the spring, we we grow like here. I'm looking at these pictures. So when you're getting into wholesale markets, you've got to grow a product that's just premium, nice, especially when you market through the upper end markets. Um, diversifying within that season is all year round, and then doing summer vegetables. And we would try to we grow our summer vegetables uh, from you know starting in the greenhouse till about now, and then zucchini. And we, 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 with zucchini, we could get a, a crop up and growing from uh, about 50 days. So that was our first catch we could get out of the season from seed to harvest. And then we pick after that 50 days, we start picking maybe four to six weeks. And then we move into our summer vegetables like your, your cucumbers and your tomato. Uh, of course, here you see that other squash too. But um, And then eggplant, watermelon, all that stuff. And then we would try to get it out of that by the time we start prune harvest. Because that would be by August 15th, we'd be, want to be out of our vegetables and be done with those. Mm -hmm. And then we're into prunes and then peaches and then either pistachios or walnuts. And then you've got your winter crops. So eventually we said, hey, we don't want to do, we, you're, you're running all year round. And so the winter crops, they said, you know, we're, we're done with those. We're not going to do turnips and radish and all that stuff. And so then we just stayed the vegetables. And now at our, some of various reasons of we could get into if you wanted to. We're moving more toward orchard crops and less out into the vegetable business. But um, something else I got to mention about that was, yeah, anyway, just that all year round diversification sometimes can be a little bit wary, but it's, it also can provide you a lot of balance of income in terms of one crop or not. Okay. In this slide, you know. You kind of get to a certain point, and you definitely need help, and you hire somebody that comes and works for you. Well, um, if you have a little bit more diversification, like you can spread, you know, like the seasonal, like we were talking about, then then you can evenly spread out your income, not just your income, but also work for your employees, so they're not right. So you can keep year-round people gr helping you all year round, mm -hmm. rather than just a short window. Because when we get it, when we're doing peach harvest, um, even when we got out of the vegetables more, that was a tougher deal because you'd have to find about 30, 40 people to come and help you in about a 10-week, 10-day win window. And so by having your labor spread out over a longer part of the season, you had people could help you all year round. That was a, kind of a good thing. Yeah, for both sides. And then you get people like Bob. He. That guy was one of the best employees we ever had. He he could have almost just walked in my shoes and said, hey, Bob, just go do it. You know, and I love that because he would come to work. And so I'm just in terms of diversifying labors, an amazing thing, too. He would he would leave work and say, I'll come back and play tomorrow. <laughs> and he meant and it. And he lived an hour and a half away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Another reason that um, I wanted to mention on diversification is it's um, not only for your marketing or your income, but you have to deal with the environment we live in, weather, and and because this last year, obviously, we've had a ton of rain now, but we were definitely in a drought, and um, you know our our dams and lakes were like lower than they've ever been, you know, since they were made. Um, and so these can affect your crops as well. It may be at times that it's going to affect one more than another. You know, like, like in our case with the drought, you know, there may be certain products that you have that are not, you know, like our veggies, 
you know, we had our well, we could still water. It was a big challenge to try and water our orchards. That was really tough. We were cut half our water. Um, and so um, we were, you know, pulling sprinkler pipes to every orchard and every row and, you know. Um, so um, anyway, I just kind of wanted to bring that up that that also is another way um, yeah, just on of personal, diversifying. Again, on a personal level of that regard, you know, prunes, that's been all my life. But some years during the bloom time, if it's too hot, they won't pollinate. We've had some years where we had no crop. So that's just, if that's all we had, that, that seemed to be why we would move to these other areas to produce some. That, that was in about three years in a row almost. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes diversification can be, can be uh, like, you know, you, you don't want to overdo it and just run yourself ragged necessarily. But it's, you know, so we had some produce and we, you know, you have a prune crop filler where then you've still got some produce to get some income on. But... Um, you know, you don't want to overdo it and, you know, run yourself ragged either. So, um, but, it, but, you know, there, there's other risks. Um, your insects and your disease, you know, and the quality of your commodities. Sometimes, you know, maybe your tomatoes only get this big or, you know, whatever. And, and, and a, mar you know, a market, farmer's market level or anything like that, uh, you – you can probably sell them if you're going more wholesale. You know they want them a premium, perfect, perfect size. <clears throat> so this is just another picture of um, different crops and doing different things on our farm. So um, and then we've been talking about orchards also. These are just a couple pictures of um, of our prunes planting an orchard. We've been getting a little bit more out of produce um, for a lot of reasons. Age, labor, hard to find labor, and all the regulations with that. And, um, you know, our orchards are more mechanized. So, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to do most of our own work that way. Here's our walnuts, a picture of our walnuts. So another diversification that we went through, and then our hay, like we talked about. Here's, here's another thing to think about, if my picture will go. Oops. Nursery. Nursery can bring a good income um, if you don't have a lot of land. And in this case, I'll kind of let Brad tell a story of how that happened. So back in, yeah, the 70s, uh, kiwi became a big thing. If you're familiar with the fuzzy fruit, and Gridley was the kiwi capital of the U.S. or that's where we lived. And so we we didn't have a lot of land to grow, and it was very expensive to put in a vineyard. So I decided on a small piece of ground I could grow nursery stock on, and so that's what I did. I, I we started from seed uh, using a certain variety, and um, Grew those seeds big enough to graft, grafted for that that season, and and then I sold plants. So I thought, well, that was back when, if you're talking about wages, it might have been. It seemed, if I'm, I'm thinking off the top of my head, it seemed like minimum wage was like two or three dollars an hour, at that point. And so, you know, when I'm I'm working, I'm thinking, well, I could make plant seven thousand plants on an acre, and. Um, sell them for seven bucks or so. That seemed like a lot of money to me for a small piece of ground. You know, I could make 40 some thousand dollars on a on an acre of ground. You know, so that's what I did as a diversification. That plus then we got into prune nurseries because we wanted to start a prune orchard so we grew our nursery stock for prunes. And pretty soon you got a different skill. You could do, you know, different things you can diversify to. So that's one of the things. And in this case, because I didn't have a lot of land, we planted our nursery stock right between our vineyards until they got, because they weren't big enough yet. So they, you can see our vineyard up. I had a small small vineyard, and then we planted the nursery in between the trees. It's been a tradition of mine just to try to use every piece of ground I've got to grow something, to try to make it, because that's my income. That's how I, if it just sits there, it doesn't do anything. So that's just one way or other way I've kind of worked that. 
and I think I'll throw in here, I, I didn't have a slide of it, but Brad reminded me <laughs> a couple more of our, in our farming journey of diversifications that we had. And one is I, we had a, uh, we have a house next door that was vacant at the time. We used it kind of as a guest house and um, I, I made it into a little store. And, um, and so then it was kind of fun because not only did I sell my produce in the store, but I, I got a little thing going with the community and they'd bring in, well, I make these or I make aprons or I, you know, whatever. So it, it was kind of a cute little store and the community got involved with it and it was kind of a, a fun deal we did for a while. And then the other one, you know, and um, was the CSA program. And I know some of you have, I know you know what that is or probably have been involved in doing that yourself, but we also did that for a while. Okay, so. You, you all know what a C, you guys say, when you say CSA, you kind of know what that is. Most of you probably do. Okay, maybe it's not me and you. Yeah, and, and um, you know, some, some of these ventures take off and some of them kind of don't, but within three months I had 100 customers. So, and, and that's where I stopped because at that time, the only, um, I, I had drops. Like I had group drops at different locations uh, besides our farm, and I could only fit a hundred boxes in my suburban. So that's where, that's where I quit my number. <laughs> and we talked about custom harvesting. This is I'll just show you. Uh, it, you know, I got to be a pretty big business. Um, this uh, pistachios that we harvest is actually down in this area. Uh, more so, and they own how many? Uh, well, yeah, this ranch we were picking for was um, just pistachios was 50 square miles. And I think their whole farm was about 100 square miles. So they have pomegranates and almonds and pistachios. So we would go down and just, you know, work to our heart's content picking pistachios. And that's kind of where this comes from. And that, that was another diversification of our business. That was about a six-week window. We try to get that done. It wasn't all us. There was a lot of contracted. Yeah, so we, weren't the only ones. We, we, we ran harvesters along with about 50 other harvesters down there. And I don't know what. Now they've gotten all in-house. So they bought all their own equipment. And so we don't, we don't work down there anymore. But, but an interesting note that I, I kind of want to share here. Um, as far as getting to know your marketers or the people you work with. Um, one of the guys that manages part of that ranch, I don't know, did he come up and visit us before? He was, he was the manager that I worked for. Anyway, our little tiny farm, he wanted to come borrow a piece of our equipment <laughs> because he wanted to start raising his own bees for pollination down there, and he wanted to use our little piece of equipment. Yeah, so we were, he came up to visit, I forget why, but um, we were growing, in our case, we grow a lot of beneficial flowers in our vegetable area at that time. And he recognized the flowers that they were wanting to produce for their bees down at their farm. So he puts in a 40-acre bee house, you might say, at their ranch. That they're, they're growing blue bees. And so they're putting in a small operation, and we had the equipment to do it with. So we just trucked our equipment down there. It's 300 miles from here to Bakersfield, and and, and helped them. We just loaned them the equipment, basically. And and that anyway. But that 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 maybe show you the aspect of within your own farm, and with big farms, doesn't matter. You don't know who you're going to run into, and the relationships you're going to develop in your diversity. So it's not diversity of crops. It's diversity of people, the people you get to know, and the things you do with them. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a good question. I don't have the answer at, right now to tell you the specific kinds. But, but our main ones, and I don't think they were the ones he was looking at because we had a we had a beneficial blend at that time we had planted, and he recognized certain species in there that he wanted to grow. We we typically grow for my main, although we've done a lot of different types. What we kind of honed it in on that I like is is for summer beneficials in my vegetables is alyssum. Um, cilantro, which is, 
what's the other name? Coriander. Coriander and um, uh, dill provide me with the best uh, uh, kind of a level of flowers and beneficial attraction for insects. Those are the three that I kind of concentrate on now. These were, used to be we grow oh, just myriads of types of flowers. They look beautiful out there, but we kind of narrowed it down. Yeah, these are the ones that we kind of came up that were actually benefiting us yes, <laughs> the most, besides the beauty. So how did the market and the flowers? Yeah, we did. They were just to provide benefit, benefit to the farm. Yeah, just bees and insects. It, we weren't selling the flowers, yeah. We were using we were using them as part of our pest management program, since we farm organically, and um, these beneficial pests. I mean, uh, insects would come in and do things to the bad insects. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was an attraction for them to come in. If we didn't have a if we didn't have bad insects, they had at least a food source. You know, they could come in and kind of they could be there too. But it, it, some of these aspects that we do, you think well. Like a gentleman here, the last class we had, do you see the benefit? Do you, do you know that it's working? Well, not always, but in some cases, yes. Here's just another picture of diversity and just also explaining. This is, you know, we have walnuts, but we don't have enough walnuts to merit buying all the equipment to harvest it. And so this is just a picture in our orchard of our walnuts being harvested by another farmer in the area that does have the equipment. So I just kind of wanted to show you another uh, way, you know, to get things done um, if you might not have the money to do it all yourself. Okay, so um, as a farmer, a lot of times you have to be your own marketer. And... Um, so I wanted to bring in here, too, uh, we've touched a little bit on, um, you know, different markets, your retail markets, your wholesale markets, your farmer's markets, your CSAs, grocery stores, you know, online stores are becoming popular now. Uh, we started one. Um, this is some of how we bag some of our online product. And grocery store chains, um, et cetera. Um, but I wanted to mention, too, in the marketing department, um, we, you know, you can also get brokers to help you. You know, you don't have to try and, you know, if you're just not moving something, you know, and there there are brokers out there. They do take a little bit of your, you know, your your income from that. They, they want a little bit of your sale pro, uh, income. But that is a, a way also of diversifying and maybe growing your business and, and I'd just like to kind of mention, I mean, it kind of fell in our hands, but when we were getting back into the produce business, we actually had someone come to us and offer to broker our stuff. And he actually lived on our farm for a summer, and he knew our whole process. And so then he moved to an office in the Bay Area, but he was an excellent seller of our, our produce. He sold tons of our produce, which enabled us to grow our business. Uh, so even though we were paying him a commission, um, he exponentially grew our business and could have grown more, you know, but we just, you know, you have to have, storage and refrigerate, you know, all those things, you either decide, well, I'm going to stay at this level or I'm going to have to build bigger storehouses and cooling and, you know, things like that. So. Okay. Is there anything else we were? Well, that last slide for me kind of makes me think of diversity of marketing. And I, you know, I don't know what each of you are into, but that becomes – a big part of what you're going to do if you're going to make money is your marketing. And those aspects of diversification could be, in our case, it's uh, wholesale and retail, like she did the stores, or your CSA, or your we, – we have some, developed some relationships with people who buy their, for their fruit stands. So they'll come by, and then – so we're trying to market all levels of our stuff, the perfect stuff, and usually that leaves you with second day, second grade – stuff too and so we get into well where are you going to sell that you know how do you deal with that so all those or are you going to process it so that's just part of the 
the marketing of, you know, you diversify. Well, I'm not sure where all you, where, where everybody is in their diversification in this class, you know, what they're trying to achieve. But the marketing side seems to me always comes into play if you're going to, unless you're just going to grow a lot, unless you just want to grow a lot of stuff in your garden to eat, you know, and, and to learn how to do that is another aspect, you know, which I do. If I was just doing my own life, I'd just say that's where I want to be. I'm just going to grow my own garden. Everybody else go there and do their own thing, you know. I just, everybody else let the world go by, you know. <laughs> See, that's where I am. And it is amazing. And so I'm thinking, but we still have to, in some ways, well, in California, I'm like, you guys, do you guys pay taxes anywhere else? I mean, it's like if we own our own land and not have to pay taxes, that would be a, a neat deal. I don't know why we voted that in ever, <laughs> you know, because you can't ever own your own land. So uh, anytime I, I, if I just had my own garden, I'd still have to pay, have cash flow sometimes. And so that's, that's part of the, anyway, me, I'm getting off our subject, but, but that's kind of the reality of it is diversifying creates a whole a huge uh, aspect of work at the same time income and in various aspects and uh, in our case we've been from we've been through this for years and now we're going back to orchard we kind of been through I start out with vegetables to orchard to vegetables and now we're kind of moving back into orchard again as our main uh, crops we're growing but my love would be the diversification of the garden so I have a couple greenhouses I grow my own food in the winter and I grow summer produce to sell and to eat, and um, then we we market. We may now we make most of our, uh, uh, hopefully most of our income off our orchard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we're diversifying into my wife and daughter done an online store. You know that's because our wholesale side, we've gone from we're, we're small growers. You know, big it's getting big, it's getting bigger, and the little are getting littler, and we're kind of in that edge of kind of. Think, uh, uh, you know, where where do we fit? And so until we get, we develop more personal relationship with individual people, the big customers are saying, because we went from regional buyers, and we could go we could go see them. We could go, just go to their face and say, and we do that now on our small markets here. We got some, some small local stores. What, how many stores are there? We went maybe 20 stores. We just went to their back door of the manager's office, introduced ourselves, took some produce, here we, and he and so he's buying produce from us, and so we kind of. But that's face to face. We'd go to the big buyers same way. Now they went to national buying, and so that's in Texas, and it's kind of like, who are you? And now you know Amazon owns them now, so you know we're not really the in the business there anymore. So the direct sales and that kind of diversification. So the marketing diversification and the growing diversification is all part of the picture. Mm -hmm. And I think in farming, you know, that's a pretty important word. I think sometimes you just have to figure out, well, what am I? What else am I going to do that's going to put food on my table? But I mean, it's in, you know, saying that it's funny. You're a farmer growing food, but but being able to, to to support yourself, you know, thinking of things. So, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. We grow prunes, walnuts, and then we grow. Um, you talk for a market. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So uh, we're growing walnuts and prunes as our main product, but we also um, grow fresh market tomato, and that's for for income. But we're growing, you know, in terms of our own personal growing. You know, we have people that want food. You know that we grow for we grow we, so another diversification that might be in this we grow food for trade mm -hmm. so we have some uh, you know people we do business with and we trade services for food so we'll take produce to the office and they'll like chiropractor my or, chiropractor trades me food you know various things like that hairdresser chiropractor my hairdresser trades me so food. so we're growing uh, you know right now we've got uh, what carrots and uh, carrots and beets and uh, arugula and and um, the sorrel, uh, cabbage, broccoli, um, cauliflower, um, parsley, potatoes. cilantro, potatoes. We grow two crops of potatoes uh, every year, fall and the winter. I mean, a, a spring and a, a fall crop. We um, pineapple. Pineapple. Yeah, just for fun, we grow pineapple and and a little bit guava. of guava. 
but those and so those yeah those and you know our summertime we got we got onions and and uh, you know winter squash and zucchini and we grow popcorn too. Yep. Uh, so so <laughs> popcorn is one of our fun things. We 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 grow, but that's all hand labor. Yeah. You know. So it's tough, and we just sweet we, corn. So my my question is, I mean, it seems like you guys have applied the principles of winter sport, and so you know, because I've very much focused on my farmers this year on single season winter sport. Like we're going to grow tomatoes and spring. Right. Yeah, and I was all of ho- that. I was yeah, I was hoping to bring that, but like, are you, are you big enough? You are selling like to Whole Foods or something like that? I mean, yeah, yeah, okay. So so then what I would say is I, I would connect with those people that are buying your product. Like we had connections with the Whole Food buyers, you know, and we got to be pretty, you know, I mean they they'd want to see us. It wasn't like I have three minutes. So what what is a need? They can tell you also. They can tell you, hey, we're short on this, or we could, you know, if you want to grow this. Yeah, so one, one time our buyer asked us to grow um, bitter melon. Hey, could you grow some bitter melon? Heck, well, maybe. And so we did. You know, that's a that's a Asian. They're trying to expand their Asian market. Um, so that, you know, who wants to buy it would be one place I would start, you know. And, and the other one is, which is maybe on the other side of it, is what do you like to grow? So that's the backside. Oh, I'd like to grow this. I'm going to find a market for it. Or I'm going to find the market, so I'll grow it. So it could be either way. You know, we've been through both of them. And um, what do you like to grow? you got tomatoes you're growing for some markets now. You're pretty good at that. So if you're going to fit it in the same time frame, we did really well with eggplant. And I didn't like eggplant. And I didn't know who would buy it. sold. I said, who would bought a lot of eggplant. Who would, I said, when they first asked me to grow eggplant, I thought, who would buy it? <laughs> but we, and we sold to uh, pro- food processing, Amy's Kitchen, eggplant, surprisingly so. And I thought, wow. For, for frozen eggplant parmesan. <laughs> and so they, they, they want, you know, so your markets, and I don't, they were the ones that came to us, say, hey, could you grow us eggplant for us? Did you have a question? Oh. Oh, Okay. Okay. Sorry, yeah. 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 So you're wondering how do you can attract people to come and buy your pro, your product at, at a at a store or at a school? So are you are they are you able to sell what you grow so far? Yeah. But you're looking to do more. Yeah. Well. So how can you expand your markets? Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it, just a little example here. It, it's just going to people. Go to restaurants in your area. Hey, you know, we're growing salad greens, you know. Is is, your, is there a need or is there an opportunity there? We just, it's it's been a, a couple-year process for us, but we finally just got another buyer in the Bay Area for our prunes. But it's that one-on-one eye contact. Yeah, so you, you, you could kind of go to walk walk the walk you know you got to go see people and find who wants it for you know i don't i don't know in your case you know are there stores are there are there other relationships you can develop with what you grow they're looking to buy cafeterias you know i don't know you know schools jails 
if it's getting harder to go step in the back door and say, here, this is what I've got. That's what I started doing because, you know, now you have new regulatory things that kind of step in front of that. I don't know if there's, you know, in that, in your case, I don't know what you're dealing with in that regard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if they ever have any farmers markets in your place, but that's always a, a good place to get to know people and for them to get to know what you have, and then it can expand from that too. Yeah, we've been the farmers. Or market. offer CSAs with people, you know, parents of the schools or or faculty or. Or a church, you know, churches around there. Would they want CAs boxes or that kind of thing? I, I think our time's up. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming to our presentation. I hope it's been a little bit helpful to you. And uh, and truly, we're, we're here for the time. So if you guys have any questions, we're happy to visit with you. Thank you. How do you say Albany? Ammons. <laughs> yeah, there's a truth to that. But I'm sure most people already know. There's a reason for it. There's Both are correct. But it just depends on where they are on the tree. <laughs>